what's taking place below the surface of the soil is as important as what's going on on top. It's not hundreds of thousands, but it's in the millions. One stumble could cost you a lifetime career that you can't pay back. Be as organized as you can be, work as hard as you can, and kind of let the chips fall where they're gonna fall. My cousin would commit suicide. He ended up taking his life over the farm. I understand, farming is, is tough. It's a lot of work and it's hard, but it's pretty darn rewarding too. I wouldn't change it for the world. Have the margins ever been tighter? No, I'd say this year, the margin is probably as tight as they've ever been. I think if anything bad was to happen, you know, uh, it would uh, take you to the bottom immediately. American farmers have had a tough couple of years between bad weather and this trade war with China. Here in the United States, farm bankruptcies are up nearly 24% in just the last China have signed a partial trade year. deal aimed at easing the 18-month trade conflict between the world's two biggest economies. GMT President GMT Trump and China's vice premier attended Britain is no longer part of the European masks, Union. Chinese authorities have traced a new deadly virus back to this seafood market uh, caused in the city by low commodity prices and an inability to the murder sell for those for its powerful sting and the way it decapitates its prey, this is the today, first time officially the declaring a national business. emergency. Desperate for supplies, New Jersey doctor Alexander Salerno has set up triage tents to handle 300 wow. patients Fires a day. scorching the west coast, leaving behind a path of death Portland, and Oregon, destruction. Protests continued for the 56th weather now and the brutal effects of the derecho. It was their models the Midwest, that created the ability to see what these mitigation they could depress press the curve from that giant so blue. much that they actually had to put a, an emergency trigger that stopped trading and the expectation the and fear the is that we will see market in the feeding 60% more people than they did this time of last year. Especially Including north and west of Richmond, all that is running off, so we are far from being done with the flooding problems. Let me show you what we've poured his entire production of milk for the day down the drain. He's done it every day for three weeks. Five years ago, in our research, we would almost never see 300 bushels. I mean, we'd have a plot here, a plot there, but I'll tell you today, it's almost routine. And I, I think a lot of it comes down to the genetics. You know, now the plant breeders have what's called marker-assisted genetics. 
They have that gene chipper that works 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every single day of the year. And so that means the genetic potential, it, it goes up at an incredible rate. And now it becomes trying to manage to achieve that genetic potential. You know, like I said, there is common themes. You know, you can't be the best without using the best stuff. You know, you have to use good products that work if you want to be chasing these kind of yields. Titan and Accomplished is very invaluable chasing 500 bushel. We have to ramp up microbial activity, uh, and those are products that do that. You know, I, I've never been married, never had any kids. Obviously, I wish I had some kids, but uh, that's one thing that drives me harder to the farm is, uh, you know, I've got more time to do that. Um, whereas, you know, a family man needs to be at home, and he should be. And uh, I enjoy being in the field, and I feel like I'm married to that and, uh, and love it. Don't want to be nowhere else. Actually, my dad and uncle farmed a small farm, about 1,200 acres, coming out of high school and all through school, worked with them. And in my mid twenties, I decided to uh, move on another direction and bought some tractor trailers and hauled demolition. That was the most money I'd ever seen in my entire life. I was making $250 working on a farm and then all of a sudden making $600 a day. I was putting money away that I'd never seen before, working up for that data by my first tractor. And that came along later on and bought my first tractor. And uh, here we are today close to 5,000 acres farming. Seven tractors now, all red. She's the boss. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> I've already told my kids, do not marry a farmer. I'll be talking about something I've been pondering about. First thing she'll say, well, we don't have the money. <laughs> That's the best thing that could have ever happen for our relationship because I really did not know what the stress of farming was until I got a hold of the checkbook and had to start writing out the bills. I always tell Sean, this is, don't worry about it. It will pay for itself. He does the yelling, I do the crying. We could not do what we do without everybody helping out. And we all understand that. I started farming when I was four. I was fireman on my own at 14. I took a hiatus for six years and went in the Marine Corps after high school. But other than that, this is all I've done. You know, you asked Don what his success has been. The number one thing is uh, understand your soil, know your soil. He knows the soil better than most people. I am not smart enough to do it all myself. I tap into guys like Clay Marks and Karen Zuver, and that's the reason why I'm here, so. I went to Iowa State and majored in egg business and thought I would either go to the Board of Trade or a bank. I lasted three semesters in college and I quit because I didn't like being indoors. I have three sons, Connor, Colin, and Cale. They're 21, 19, and 17. I enjoy working with them and uh, I like them as people as well as I, I enjoy them and love them as my sons. Going to church camp when I was a kid with my mom, there was always a campfire song that you're supposed to let your light shine. Well, I'd like to have a damn forest fire. Well, the National Corn Growers have a yield contest. And they actually, uh, they have different categories. So there's, there's nine different categories based on the, 
it's the state corn area. They have tillage categories. They have irrigation categories. So you, you get to be in a category. Three national winners in each category. So 27 national winners. And I think what the contest really does is it shows the yield potential that exists. It shows how high can yield go. Heath Cottrell, Kevin Kolb, Don Stahl, and to be associated with those names is, uh, it's a lot to comprehend. We've been chasing the non-irrigated world record, which is 443. We still are shooting for that 400 plus bushel range. Truthfully, we've been knocking on 400 last three years. We have 386, 388, 394. Iowa state record is 445 bushel corn. And uh, I really want to raise 446. We're shooting for 400. I mean, we're close to it. We've knocked on the door this past year. Uh, we won nationally at uh, 382 bushels. I think if, uh, if there's any criticism is that they don't have to tell all of their secrets. I'm not going to tell them all the things that work for me, and they're not going to tell me all their things either. Uh, there is some secrets. They always hold a few things back because the contest is quite competitive. I sure would like to beat all three of them, and uh, I would like to beat Kevin Kolb just so I could tease him a little bit, but he's such a good guy and such a good farmer. You know, Heath and, uh, and Kelly there, the, they better bring their A game. We just use it as a way to, to go out and play and try to find ways to bump the yield. I have friends that golf and fish, hunt, and I irrigate things to see how big a yield I can raise on my corn. You know, that's, that's what I do. For centuries, farmers knew one way to plant. Dig a hole, plant a seed, cover it up. Planting one acre took two weeks. Early plows weren't much better. But in 1731, an English farmer named Jethro Tull, no, not that Jethro Tull, this Jethro Tull, forged a blade that would slice into the hard sod. Now, one acre took one week. In America, John Deere invented a self-polishing plow that wouldn't bog down in the sticky Midwestern soil. By 1837, one acre took one day. Henry Blair, the second African-American to ever receive a U.S. patent, invented the corn planter. That sped things up even more. And by 1920, tractors were becoming common. So today, a 24-row planter can do in 30 seconds what it took Jethro Tull one week to accomplish. Of course, Tull did go on to sell 60 million records. <laughs> This year has probably been the most challenging just due to COVID, uh, the grain markets, and the trade, the trade deal, you know, that never seemed to went through for the farmers. How competitive are you against these other guys? Pretty damn competitive. I want to try to stay up at the top, but obviously, you know, that's can be out of my hands, but if I can wiggle my way up there some kind of way, I'm gonna be right there with these pretty blue eyes. <laughs> Does the fact that your corn is late, how is that going to affect things? Well, hopefully it won't affect things too badly. Uh, we planted corn last year a little bit late and it turned out really well for us. And uh, the only things I'd say we'd be concerned with planting corn late would be uh, hurricane season right here on the East Coast. You know, everything they did, they, they dug by hand all the time. For four months out of the year, that's all they would do is shovel and lay tile. I can remember my great uncle saying that to get the tile down through some of them high spots that shovel and he was up over his head throwing dirt out of the hole and I mean and they had to have to do that for you know quarter mile long runs. He had a size 21 ring finger. Size 21 ring finger. He bowled there 
My thumbs, both my thumbs would fit in this thumb hole. <laughs> I was gonna say, your ring finger's a 12. But Ralph was a bachelor. Mm -hmm. He was the smartest man I've ever known about growing corn. I mean, if he would be alive now, with the technology now, we'd be talking about that man. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was growing 300 plus bushel corn in the 80s. Okay. I mean, he lived and died corn. I just wish I'd have paid a little bit more attention to him. Back in 2017, we would be underwater right now. We had 10 inches of rain in eight hours. People gripe about drought. They don't know troubles till they have floods. But the weather's still been a pain in the butt for 2020. We plant everything two and a quarter inches deep. And we got about eight tenths of an inch of rain in like 10, 15 minutes. I've never seen it before. It was like our seed floated up to about an inch and a quarter. But if the seed was actually at two inches deep, like it should be, mm -hmm. you would probably have two and a half to three times the root mass. That's how important planting depth is. You know, that's why we run Accomplish and all these other stuff to try to speed it up to get it out of the ground, because that's the battle. You know, I feel like if we'd, if we'd got this corn up, we'd had a perfect stand and the battle was done. Then it's easy. Now it becomes hard with an uneven stand. No matter what I do to it, I am not going to reach full, full potential of what this field could do. A couple years ago, the whole river bottom got wiped out, and we thought that was so terrible, but we ended up doing 388. I think we might actually find out that this might be one of our best years. You got to look positive in farming, and that's why me and Kevin get along so well. He's the negative, and I'm to the positive. The Iowa State record is 445 bushel corn, and I want to raise 446. I believe I can raise a half a pound of corn per stalk. Six tenths of a pound of corn per stalk is considered A plus work. It takes 49,652 plants at a half a pound to, to raise 446. I've got a pretty good stand of 48,700. So we fell just a bit short of it, but we're awful close. I'm not afraid to try new things, and I'm not afraid to try to get to the next level. You know, my son that's going to be a senior, he's in a, a major in agronomy at Iowa State. He's becoming a good resource. And then we have a uh, agronomist from Nutrien, Mike Evans, that we work very closely with. We use Radiate and Accomplish on every acre that we farm. And that's because of Mike. Mike brought those products to us when we wanted to start, you know, reaching out, trying to do better, trying to get to the next yield ceiling, I guess you'd say, the uh, break the yield barriers that we have. The weather was not an issue from April 20th till about May 3rd. And we planted 95% of our crop in those 13 days. It just flew in and it, it really was a great spring. We just really had a tremendous start. So we went and did some stand counts in those two fields up there on M50. One thing is this stuff is uneven, obviously, because mm -hmm. of how tough it was coming out of the soil. How much should we Realistically, that? well, obviously you're going to replant that other field. Not going to be 200. So. No. It's always bad news. I'm sorry, I know. That's what I told him when you come and you're carrying plants, it's never good. <laughs> well, we were replanting corn. We've had such a crappy season so far. The corn got beat up by some heavy rain. First it went in in cold weather. We didn't seem to want to warm up this spring. So we were planting into soils that were 38 degrees to 40 degrees when typically we don't want to plant until it's like 50. We've had about seven or eight days to plant, both corn and beans, whole crop. The first of May, we start planting and the rain came with it. And about seven inches of rain later, that kind of beat up our crop, compacted our soil and caused a lot of drowned out spots. You're playing catch up already. Absolutely, we're playing catch up. When you get 6.3 inches of rain that period of time uh, with cold weather, it really hurts your stand. There's nothing you can do to avoid it. Right now, we're just trying to stop the bleeding because we've already lost our top yield potential. There's some fields we have to rip up and start from scratch, so not a, not a fun season so far.
Used to be, knee-high by the 4th of July meant your corn was off to a pretty good start. Now it means call your crop insurance rep. A big reason? Fertilizer. Even the first farmers figured out that field crops needed food. Fish, manure, bones, guano. But the big breakthrough came in 1908 when Fritz Haber and Carl Bosch, mm-hmm, that Bosch, developed a process to convert nitrogen and hydrogen into ammonia. Basically, they took air and fed the world. In 1955, in another important development, a Texas farmer named Bob Pedigo developed a process that would capture the essence of what soil microbes do naturally. And from this, he created a biocatalyst that could benefit plants and the soil. Meaning corn today is... The corn is as high as an elephant's eye. Between 8 and 10 feet, depending upon the elephant. So when I go back home and they say, you know, what are you doing these days? We're looking at new ways to create higher yields in our corn and soybean. And so I like to tell them that we're looking at things like the soil um, and what's going on below the ground. There is a whole vast source of nutrients in the soil. And if we can make the, some of those more available, that has a real value. There's so much we don't know that's going on in our soil systems. There's so much we can maximize on and take to the next level. And this biocatalyst area is the next big opportunity in ag. We are kind of making a mistake always worried about the plants. And we need to be worried about the biology of the soil. And if we can take care of the biology of the soil, the plant is secondary. It's just, uh, it's what happens when we do a good job with the biology. Every single grower knows the value of manure. I can go out on this farm right here and I can tell you where 30 years ago the animals used to be because I can still see the effect. What I like to think of a product like Accomplish as or Titan is it's trying to capture the essence of the value that's in that manure. It helps make immobile nutrients more available. What's the story? I mean, when you put these products in the soils, what different mechanisms are they putting into play, so to speak, to upregulate that whole system? So once you know that story, you then know exactly where that product is acting, and you can better fit it into the system for the growers to maximize response. When did you start using Accomplish? Oh gosh, we started using Accomplish so long ago, I couldn't even tell you when we started. But I'm guessing it's been 10 years. The uh, competition, we're always trying to do new things and uh, hear, hear other people talking, you know, good about Agerson products. And uh, after hearing what I thought it would do and they thought it would do for me, we tried it and uh, been happy ever since. So we use um, Accomplish and Levitate. Putting Accomplish in furrow we, we do that on every acre of corn and soybeans. We uh, put radiate in furrow. We thought then that first year we seen about 15, 20 bushel jump there. And, uh, and then once we started enhancing our uh, management more and more, you know, we're just seeing every year more and more release of the P and K for us. And we can tell that by you see a, a better, ro more robust plant compared to where we don't use it. We still do plots where we use it and we don't because we want to make sure we're still getting that repeatability. The roots with Accomplish and without, if you saw that, you'd never go without it. The plant is healthier, the plant is greener, it's bigger, you know, and all that translates out to yield in the end. Breaking news, Florida facing a double threat right now, right in the middle of this deadly pandemic. A hurricane is moving in. As we come on the air, Hurricane Isaias is edging toward the coast, strengthening overnight, in fact, packing winds of 85 miles an hour. 
severe thunderstorm capable of producing a tornado was located over Norfolk. Tornadoes are extremely difficult to see and confirm at night. Do not wait to see or hear the tornado. Take cover now. We had a hurricane come in here the other day. Luckily, we missed the biggest part of it, but we had some uh, gust up to 70 mile an hour winds and raised a good corn crop and then sad to come in here and watch it laying on the ground the way it is, broke off. And But it is what it is, there ain't no changing it. From what it went through this year, from flooding to drought, you know, it all handled it well. You know, there's no, uh, nothing you can do with a hurricane. I mean, that's pretty much a, a done deal once it zips through here. And, you know, like I said, you're left to pick up the pieces once it's gone. You see farmers that are good farmers, and then you see farmers that are excellent farmers. And Heath is an excellent farmer, constantly is monitoring his crops. Uh, we're in Curry Tuck, North Carolina, just across the state line in Virginia. This is uh, one of our contest fields. Uh, this field's about 125 acres. We're happy with the way it looks. After having a hurricane, this field actually don't really see any damage, believe it or not. Any predictions out of this? I'd hate to give you any predictions just yet, but you know, it, it should be a, hopefully a state win, if anything. <laughs> We'll have two entries this year. We'll have uh, an entry in North Carolina and one in Virginia, since I live on farm both states. What would it mean to you? I've already done it. To take, to, <laughs> what would it mean to you to, to win in two states? I did it. Uh, two years ago, I won national in Virginia and first place in North Carolina. So. You're a bad dude. Yeah, we're badasses when we gotta be. <laughs> <laughs> We are potentially raising the best crop we've ever raised. You know, the last few years, 17, 18, and 19, we've been short of sunlight. So this year we've got enough GDUs. The irrigated corn looks tremendous. The irrigated beans look tremendous. It's all the dry land. It has never shown stress, but it would never hurt my feelings if it rained. He's willing to learn at every step of the way, and he ain't afraid to try, and that, I mean, that's, that's the game, is trying and learning. When I talk about raising potentially the biggest crop we have, I need to get as much phosphorus as I can into the plant. The Titan makes that possible. Accomplished helps with the nitrogen, and it's not just nitrogen, but it's plant available nitrogen. And when you get 50,000 plants out there, 48,000 plants out there, it's tough to keep them uniform. So I feel like that's the biggest challenge, but we'll see. I think that we have a shot at something special, but again, it's only August 10th. My soybeans are looking really good. There's more nodes, the plant is bigger, the plant is healthier, and uh, we'll have to see what translates to yield, but just like the corn, we got a lot of potential there. When you wake up in the morning, what are your thoughts about the next, really, two months? I hope we catch a rain in the next few days and then I hope we have some decent sunlight to finish the crop out. Typical farmer, I'm asking for perfection, but, but if you wanna know what I want, that's what I want. And on the downside, well, here's what I don't want. Well, we don't want a bad storm. This is a storm in Iowa in August. If you're gonna get a rain in Iowa this time of year, this is what you're gonna get. 
The wind's blowing 60 miles an hour according to the Weather Channel app. Uh, we're getting a bit of pea-sized hail. My father-in-law just said yesterday that his grandfather told him that uh, it always rains in Iowa about August 10th. And I rolled my eyes and I thought, that's crazy. And here it is, August 10th, and we get a rain we weren't expecting. So maybe I should pay attention. Good morning, everyone. I'm meteorologist Taylor Canoose with a severe weather update. Uh, if you live in the west side of the Des Moines metro, you might be hearing tornado sirens blaring as we speak. We had a small chance of rain that uh, looking at the sky this morning, I didn't think was going to materialize. And out of nowhere, the storm just kind of blew up and here it came and it's Iowa in August. God dang it, it blew down all my high yield stuff. Where I planted the 50,000, it all blew down. <laughs> yes, 44,000 blew down. Yep. tell where we were chasing the state record. This is the area of the field that was planted at 50,000 that we were pushing really hard. I think it's safe to say the state record's safe for another year. The, the dry land crop will be okay. We've got some wind and hail damage. This is by far the worst. Uh, it's because of the population we put out there. Uh, I'm not disappointed I did it. You know, we just, we we're trying. So it, uh, Mother Nature's still the boss when she wants to be. Hang on, we gotta talk to Jim. Stripped up a little bit, huh? Stripped up a little bit. The high yield plot out here is flat. Oh, no, the beans are bad. They didn't go down. The, the wind isn't as bad as I thought it was gonna be when we were there at the house, but the hail is worse. You know, the hail ripped it up worse than I thought it would. You know, we didn't see that much hail there in the driveway. Uh, I expected more wind than hail. I mean, I, I would say based on the radar and what we're seeing right here, uh, everything, everything we farm will have damage. You know, we, we planted a high population to try to take a shot and it, uh, you know, the, that's more susceptible to wind, so. So just like that? Just like that. I feel, uh, I feel fortunate that it all doesn't look like that, but I, I feel pretty disappointed that, you know, we thought, we thought that we had a shot at something special and it's mother nature took it, so. Live to fight another day. The beans wouldn't canopy. They took three weeks to come up and just didn't canopy. It was cold. And uh, so our herbicide program got hurt a little bit. And uh, so we've got some weed escapes and that's not really what we want to see. But I think we go in here, we'll see some raccoon damage right here. I don't know how a raccoon thinks, but they just do some weird stuff. This is an example of Probably one or two raccoons one night did this. So, and there's times we've come back here and we've found raccoon damage that would be 10 times bigger than this in one night. I would bet we're between 10 and 20% of our crop is eaten up between the corn and the raccoons and the squirrels. So nobody's hunting 
squirrels or raccoons anymore, so. We haven't been getting a lot of rain lately, so we gotta start adding water again. Um, so we just gotta keep plugging along and see if we can't push this crop a little harder. Well, we came off the uh, real wet spring. Basically, we had three plantings of corn, the first planting, the replants, and the late plants. It's not normal for us to have to replant at the scale we've had to the last couple of years. Normally we only get one or two events a year and then, and this year it seemed like we had one or two events a week. I mean, when you're planting into 38 degree temperature soil and then you get heavy cold rain on top of that, that's not a good scenario for, for high yield. Let's talk about the market. We don't want to talk about the market. So. Nobody wants to talk about the markets. Not in 2020. It's Monday morning. Um, our ritual of pulling tissue samples of corn and soybeans. Brock, did you pull soybeans yet? Okay. So uh, we're going to head down here in the river bottoms and pull a couple tissue samples and go from there. So this field here has been corn on corn for the last 10, 12 years. With last year's flooding, we took uh, our river bottoms out, planted beans. You know, the, this is our problem with us growing soybeans on our real high fertility ground. Tons and tons of uh, vegetative growth. These beans have been burned back six times, tried to stack them to, to get them short and they're still this tall. There is zero for fertilizer that we put out here on this field and they're still this big. For no fertilizer put on there, yeah, they look really good. I'm thinking they should probably make 80. So if you can make 80 bushel beans and spend no fertilizer on it, I mean, I'll take that all day. Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 46,000. Divide that by, we'll just say 65,000 kernels. That's already at 385. So, um, yeah, I think we could be, well, we should be really close to the best that we've ever had. So. Last time we were here, you were replanting. You were saying we have too much rain. <laughs> and I think legitimately we have a good shot of breaking our own farms personal record and it looks like we're, we're on pace to be at about 80 days of grain fill this year so which is fantastic. We were so hot and dry for the first six seven weeks where we've actually went out every 10 days and sprayed a fungicide not because of disease just to help the corn plant cool respirate give it a break relieve some stress on it and that made a huge difference. You know, we've just about done everything we can do. It's in Mother Nature's hands from here on out. I met Kevin uh, several years ago um, at Commodity Classic. He seemed a little cocky, and uh, I was cocky. We kind of butt heads quite a bit on yield because you, you, you want to be the highest yielder. You know, after a year or two of that, we figured out we're basically the same old boys. Last winter, we kind of set our differences aside. I actually talked a few times, and you know, he experienced a lot last year. You know, when I lost my buddy Blake, my cousin, best friend, I said, hey man, you know, I don't know nothing about your issues, whatever, but just remember you always got friends. So it was nice to hear from him and uh, kind of give me his two cent on how to be a little more patient. <laughs> if he wants to get patience, he's got to get kids. <laughs> because the kids will either make you or break you. <laughs> Harvest. It has its own festival, its own dance, its own moon, and its own piece of equipment that changed everything. In 1915, International Harvester who else, launched the first combine pulled by a tractor. Case and John Deere followed a couple years later. Now growers could collect an acre of corn every two and a half minutes. Not that there was all that much to collect. 
back in 1866, the year the USDA started keeping track, the average acre generated just 26 bushels of corn. Then came hybrid seed, developed at Michigan State University, exactly 27 miles from Don Stahl's front door. Between seed, fertilizer, and better planting and harvesting methods, yields started going up about a bushel a year since the 30s. By the 50s, two bushels a year. Now the average yield is 168 bushels an acre, and almost all of it goes in one of these. The first grain elevator, anyone? Buffalo, New York. How come? Bruce will tell you. You'll always know your neighbor and you'll always know your pal. Another major USDA grain stocks report comes out later this morning. The report is expected to show big U.S. stocks for corn as the COVID-19 pandemic, trade problems with China, and more competition from around the world has meant U.S. corn exports have been down this year. Twenty twenty has been a bitch. We've had every element that could uh, you could have as far as uh, almost disaster through the entire growing season uh, from the day we started planting corn to you know harvest right now uh, you know we we started out planting corn in water which you know you wouldn't do you know it was a month and a half late uh, it just flooded constantly on the corn uh, stunted it never give it a good root mass uh, it just it was one thing after another and then you know hurricane after hurricane after hurricane and damn if we ain't got another hurricane knocking on the door it's another foot race to get the corn in i'm tired i'm mentally tired and i think all my guys are extremely tired It's one of the worst years that I've seen. There's a bunch of growers out there struggling right now. It's depressing for the growers, it's depressing for the community because these same guys are the guys that you, you know, go to church with, you, you, you see at the store, you know. Several of them are talking like it's, it's gonna be really hard for them to survive this year. Our yields have been anywhere between 175 bushels to 225, I'd say. Compared to what we're used to seeing, you know, it's it's way off uh, 50, 70 bushels. I'm not going to look back and say I'm dissatisfied because I've heard a lot of other horror stories from other farmers that, you know, picking 80, 100 bushel corn, and that's very unfortunate. It's approximately 8, 30, 9 o'clock in the morning. The temperature, I'm not exact, but just based on the way my ears feel, it's gotta be about 28 degrees. And uh, it's spitting just a few flurries. So not an ideal situation when you wanna go harvest. I very much wanted to break 357, which was our personal best from last year. I expected to do that. I. I was a bit optimistic that we could be north of 400. We had a tremendous crop out there. You know, the storm just took part of it. So what'd you learn and how will that help you break the state record next year? You know, I'm probably gonna select potentially a couple different hybrids that uh, I think will have more flex on them. And then I'm gonna plant a lower population I might actually increase the amount of accomplish I put in there. I think that we will probably use more of those biological products to try to help make more nutrition available in the soil. The ultimate goal is to break Francis Child's record of 442. I don't know that we would have accomplished it this year, but that is the journey we are on.
Tomorrow they're talking two to five inches. It's 51 degrees. Uh, just not real good harvest weather. Tomorrow, 100% uh, chance for rain. Uh, this corn here was our, some of our last planting, and I think it was planted June 7th, June 8th. Our anniversary. We got zero rain in June. Zero. We got zero in the month of June. Really hurt our root development. I think we had about seven inches of rain from July 13th to about August 7th or 8th. We were, were finally looking good at getting our crop. The temperatures cooled down, but then we got real cloudy. We kept less kernels on the corn than what we normally do. Our top end peaks are not quite what they were, but I mean, we still got a good corn crop. The high for me this year, honestly, was to see Kevin get excited about soybeans. And it's always been corn, 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 corn. But like soybeans, you can be an R1 and you can be an R3 at the same time. Corn don't do that. You know, I call that the man, corn the man, easy to figure out. Soybeans the woman, impossible to figure out, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, my wife is not here, that's why I said it. <laughs> We set a personal best this year in our soybean crop. We got 135 bushel an acre on dry land. We did apply Titan on it. Uh, we did uh, had applied accomplish on to break down the corn stalks last year. Um, we fed the micros. We keep our fertility up, and and it pays off when we get the weather. Don's yields on the soybeans on these plots are probably a 2x what the average farmer would have. Yeah, we're happy. We're happy about it. There's always next year though. We'll do better. Oh. We gotta do better. Like I say, we're never satisfied. We're, we're farmers, so we always want more. It's never enough, so. That's all power spot. That's new to this area. This is, it showed up last year for the first time and we had about maybe one one thousandth of the speckles last year. How big a concern is it? Not too much for this crop. There were guys in 2016 lost 50 bushel an acre. Yep. 30's, 30's not uncommon. How close were you to having a real issue? Uh, about a week. The year started off pretty horrendous. Cold and wet all the way through May. Even into June, we were still fighting frosts in the morning. I think on our irrigated plot, I think we're hoping to get over 500. You could hit 500, Don? We have an outside chance at 500 based on our kernel counts, so. What made this year so good? Heat. We had a lot of heat this year, a lot of cloud-free days, so our solar radiation was off the chart. So we were seeing a foot growth at rapid growth stage. Corn was growing a foot a night. That's huge, you don't see that normally. When you see, if it happens, I've got 500, what are you gonna do? I'm gonna call Clay. I'll call Clay and tell him we hit 500, but don't tell anybody. Probably shouldn't put that on camera because the NCGA says, no, 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 you can't tell anybody. But, but we'll be happy, I mean, but it doesn't last that long. I mean, five minutes, 10 minutes, we'll celebrate, and then it's on to getting the rest of the harvest done and trying to figure out how to beat it next year. That's the marine in me too, you don't get excited, you're just, you're just glad you're alive. <laughs>
we wanted to have a uh, you know a session uh, just interviews at the commodity classic there's no commodity classic so we're gonna like everybody else in 2020 we're gonna settle for a zoom call let me go get a bottle of liquor <laughs> <laughs> I think so many people are still stuck in the old way of farming. You know, you don't have to guess on it with these tissue samples. The whole year the strip till was behind. The plant looked good. But guess what? We don't get paid for what the looks are. We get paid by, by pounds of corn. It was just a shit year for corn around here and beans basically the same way. What made it so tough? 80 inches of water. You know, I thought we were going to have 75 bushel beans on farm average for everything, dry land and everything. And there are beans that only made like 42 because of the hail. We followed that storm all the way across the state. And at one spot, I saw a 60 foot bin, 100,000 bushel bin, six inches off Highway 30. And the cattle were running in the fields. I'd never seen devastation like that. You know, we were so dry early that we could make roots if that makes sense make them grow there so last year last year i heard of kevin call he's whining all the time about wet this year he's whining all the time about dry i'm going to get some cheese and mail it to him for his wine <laughs> oh, i appreciate that don't mail it just bring it down kelly look at all this great hair all of a sudden <laughs> the goal now for us is 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 by over 500 and hopefully 600. my agronomists say i'm i'm going to get there it's just a matter of time We've, we've worked on our fertility forever now, for about 10, 12 years, and just all the once the lid come off and the yields just exploded. And that's very motivating. That's pretty exciting when you see that. Now we just gotta try to find a way to maintain it and uh, have it happen again. Let's hear from the, from the nutrient reps real quick. Clay, you work with a lot of guys who know how to grow corn, know what they're doing, very successful. Why is Don one of the best corn growers in America? And Therefore, let's Do I have any wisdom? I don't know. I just have a lot of self-discipline. I always tell people, you know, that the Marine Corps is the biggest accomplishment of my life. It was something I did when I was 18 and, um, it wasn't about me, and I'd do it again in a minute. In the Marine Corps, we were taught to improvise, adapt, and overcome, so that's how I approach everything. You just keep plugging along, keep trying, never give up. There's nobody in this world that I know that's more competitive than Kevin Cobb on anything. I mean, it doesn't matter from sports to drive into Walmart. If we drive separate, who's going to get there first? I mean, he's just a very competitive guy. This year, he has really kind of impressed me because he's not as high strung. There is just a tremendous amount of stress the farmers put up with. You know, last year, my cousin um, committed suicide. When Blake took his life there, um, it kind of put everything in perspective. I'm looking at his his widow, his kids. Um, they don't give a shit about the farm. They want their dad. You know, they, she wants her husband. Honest to God, since all this has happened with his with his cousin, things really have changed. I mean, farming is farming, but family's family. Is your dad kind of amazed at what you're doing? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if the numbers are good, everybody gets excited. My great grandpa, I, I know he would be super excited about how we farm today and the yields that we're getting today. Because back in his day, you know, 40, 50 bushel corn was a big crop. I, I, I love farming. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't know where I'd be without it. Uh, I still get up every morning excited to go outside and and to do what I do. I don't, I don't think everybody could say that i think i've had a lot of good friends and they've all got me to where i'm at and i appreciate every one of them for doing that my dad passed away when i was young uh didn't get the opportunity to, to farm with him basically right out of high school my grandparents who i farmed with um 
they passed away. So the older generation, I never got a farm with really much. And I'm kind of looking forward to farming with the younger generation. I don't know, I'm gonna go until I, I can't go no more. <laughs> the reward is, is the lifestyle. I produce something that's tangible and I see that happen and I see my efforts paying off. I see when I do what I do that I see that the crop responds. And uh, when you harvest and the yields are big, it's very satisfying, very satisfying. You know, I love it. I can't deny that. I enjoy it. And uh, that's been a profession. I knew what I wanted to do when I was three years old, pushing toy tractors around. As costly as it is, I'm sure I'll hopefully die doing it. When you're in the combine and it's a piece of land that you own or that has been passed down through the generations, one of your sons is in the grain cart, Richie's in the other combine, my brother-in-law is in the other combine, everybody's pulling in the same direction, people are joking around on the radio, and you're out there harvesting and the corn is yielding really well, uh, you feel like you're making a good living and, and everybody's on the same team, that's not like work. I would describe it as a religious experience and that's when you, uh, when you feel like you're lucky.